Hey everybody, David here from Vegan Everywhere, and this is not only our 50th video, but it marks the halfway point of the entire six months trip. So with three months left to go in the trip, here's what I've learned. First, a recap. We came in through Delhi, we saw Lodi Park and the Red Fort. We took a hellish ride to Kulu, and we were astounded by what we saw at the Dashera Festival. Off we went to Jaipur. I had some semi-precious stone carved for some jewelry, and we saw incredible forts, including Amr Palace. We kept on proceeding through Rajasthan and to Jodhpur, where Natalia met our amazing friend Vikshaka, who dressed her up in Rajputi gear and had a beautiful photo shoot. We arrived in Udaipur the day before Deepavali and spent the whole week there witnessing the Festival of Lights. We met awesome new friends, including Channi Soni of Support Strays Udaipur, who does amazing work with dogs. I was so excited to see Ran of Kutch outside of Buj in Gujarat, and the lovely food and farm stay there was a real bonus. On the very last day there, Natalia got food poisoning in that slightly more serious type of way that is almost always me getting sick. This time, we had to briefly visit a clinic or a hospital and spent the next days in Mumbai helping her to recuperate. I went out for a couple hours in the day in Mumbai and didn't really see much except we met Dr. Reshma Rajani, the very first vegan we met in all of India, and she was kind enough to give us an interview. Pune was still used to take it easy for Natalia. We didn't love everything about Pune, but we did see Corrigan Park, the Osho Ashram area, and we really enjoyed the Pateleshwar Cave Temple. Natalia was back and up and at it, and was especially stoked on Goa, Gokarna, and Udupi, because of the range of awesome beaches of all types. In Goa, we met Atul Sarim and his team at WAG, plus a ton of vegan folks doing awesome stuff. Mysuru had amazing food in one of the most opulent palaces we have ever seen. Next, we made our way to Udi, where we enjoyed a trip on a toy train and survived a decrepit stay in a place with lots of character, let's call it. I was also a bit sick here in the traveler's way. Next, we went on to our Kerala tour and started out with Athrapilly Falls, which were lovely. On the way, we saw our first wild and free elephants. Then we were on to Kumali, where we enjoyed Periyar National Park and beautiful displays of cultural performances. We kept on proceeding south to Alepi, where we saw the Melakan Chirup Festival, and we had a houseboat trip on New Year's Eve that was okay. Off we went after that to Kavalam Beach where we thrashed around the surf and saw an awesome lighthouse. We moved on to the southernmost point of all of India in Tamil Nadu called Kanyakumari. We saw the amazing Vivekananda statue and hung out with locals during the street festivals. And now we've reached the halfway point where we leave on the way to Madurai. So what's next? The second part of the trip is going to be a bunch more Tamil Nadu and all the way up to Andhra Pradesh. We have stops in Odisha, West Bengal, Uttar Pradesh, Punjab, and probably Uttarakhand and Himachal Pradesh as well. So what have we learned? What are some tips and tricks? First of all, money. We're using UPI, which is a way to use your GPay or, or pay via a QR code. This has been super, super handy. The way we do that is by using an app called Check, C-H-E-Q, Check. We had to go and verify in one of about 20 different places you can go and set it up. We chose to do ours in Jaipur, um, but they have spots in Delhi and all the way up and down India. So basically you download the app, you pay a fee, you go and verify, and then you're able to use your UPI. What we've been using is the tourist wallet feature where you load it up with your Indian currency off of your credit card that you connect or even your debit card if you want to go into a little bit more of a elongated process and you just refill it as you need and then you scan pay everywhere you go with your card. The slight downfall of this is that it only can be used to pay merchants. So if someone is um, street vending for instance, you may not be able to pay them because they have an individual account. But for the most part, 80% of the accounts that we attempt to pay are merchant accounts and it works very well for that. This helps you manage the amount of currency you keep with you as you go and um, it just basically makes your life a lot easier. Speaking of currency, when you do currency exchange in India, there's a few things to remember. Number one, 
It's best to bring US dollar. It seems to be the most universally accepted, the most universally understood. However, here's another couple of tips about bringing the US dollar. One, bring large bills. You get a much better rate when you use $100 bills. For instance, in one place where the rate was currently 83 rupees for, uh, for every $1, we had $100 bills and we got the 83. Another place where it was about the same, 83, and we only had $50 bills and $20 bills in US currency, we got only 80 or 81 cents. So not a ton in the grand scheme of things, but significant if you are changing a lot of currency here. Also, another tip about currency, fresh, crisp, non-bent, non-dirty bills. You can forget all the stuff I say about having larger bills if you have any sort of folds or creases or even slight rips in your bills. If they take them, you'll get the lower rate. Have an Indian cell phone number. You can pick one of these up via a SIM card in the airport wait, wait, right when you arrive, or you can visit one of the service provider's main stores in any of the cities that you arrive in. Generally speaking, uh, Airtel, Vodafone, etc. should have a place for you to go get yourself a SIM card in pretty much everywhere you go with any sort of major city attached to it. Get an Indian cell phone plan. The data here for two gigs a day is incredibly cheap. We're paying about uh, six dollars Canadian a month for an excellent plan with calls and texts and everything. Uh, you are going to need it and here in India a lot of times if you want information and you're looking to phone a place that still is a really really quick and easy way to get the information. Sometimes uh, websites give conflicting results and give conflicting information. So we have been phoning the places up just directly and asking, are you open? What's the deal? And, um, and using folks uh, there who might have English to help us understand what's going on as well. I also have some advice for you on giving beggars and other people in need money. Here, we find that giving any money or indulging anyone on the street with various placards or demands or asks of you actually only makes it worse. Um, we've seen several people try to politely give a little bit of coin or a little bit of billage to people and this just brings a huge convergence of other people with needs as well um, and kind of creates like a, a storm of activity around the person. It can be really uncomfortable but uh, do your best just to say no and if you do want to give to people in need in India please look up some of the many registered aid uh, charities, NGOs, and other places that do direct good work so you know where it's going. There are also a fair amount of children being asked to work um, soliciting money from people. And although this can be very hard, um, I do look at it as possibly exploitative. It might be necessary for survival in some cases, but um, I've seen parents coaching on occasion and not very often seen parents coaching their children on how to beg better and um, applying what it looks, looks to be sort of like soccer mom or hockey dad or whatever type of pressure on them to go and get money. I just don't think that this is uh, a good thing to participate in for me. So we've just been avoiding it and we've been helping out other NGOs by volunteering and by um, putting our action where our intentions are. Tourist traps, fake spices, etc. Um, when you're being taken on a tour, say you go in a tuk-tuk and you take a local tour or you hire a guide if you do that, or even if you're just going around seeing things, it's pretty much inevitable that you're going to end up in some of these um, fake places. So first of all, let's talk about saffron as an example. Saffron should always be fairly expensive. They should be long threads, bright red, powerful in aroma, and um, you should already know ahead of time what it is you want, what quality it is you'd like to get, and what that quality looks like. In Jaipur, we were on a Tuk Tuk tour and we stopped at one of these spice shops, and I noticed that everything was kind of generically packaged. I noticed um, a tourist getting given some saffron tea, and those threads of saffron that they were putting inside the tea were very, very nice. It, it created lots of beautiful color right away, and I could smell it was real saffron. However, when the saffron they were buying was presented to them, and myself later, I noticed that this was just colored safflower. It was short, sort of hay-like, dusty, dry spices, 
um, of safflower, and it was cheaper than it should be. So good saffron starts at five, seven hundred rupees a gram. Even just for like good saffron, it should be labeled from cashmere. It should have some sort of seal on it. It should have um, distinct packaging that isn't just like someone taping on a label that says saffron. You're going to see this a lot, kind of brown paper bags, and it's just got like a, a label taped on it, saffron. I would be super careful here unless you know exactly what grade of saffron you'd like. And in this case, in India and in lots of cases, you get what you pay for. So beware of fake spices, old spices, repackaged items, uh, and anything that's too cheap for something that's premium grade, it's fake. Our budget was about $2,200 a month. And that's not including our flight, which is averaging about $500 a month total for two people. A lot of these figures are based on two people, by the way. So keep that in mind as you're trying to figure out what your budget should be. Now our goal was $2,200 a month. We're spending about as much as $2,500 a month um, without the flights. Sometimes the accommodation has been more. We were aiming for about $20 a day, but in the South, it's a little bit more. In the North, it can be a little bit less. It's averaging up to probably in the realm more like uh, of $25 to $30 a night uh, for our accommodations. Food, on the other hand, since we've been eating in local restaurants and keeping it um, pretty chill, not doing a ton in the way of lavish uh, dining and um, haute cuisine, we've been keeping it well under, so probably about $15 a day. So our averages there are still mostly intact, although we have gone up a little bit in accommodation just due to quality issues and things like this. Transportation has been going great. We've been enjoying using trains. We have used the odd expensive taxi ride, especially in Kerala where it seems like trains are a bit more spotty and buses are a little bit more difficult. We found the convenience of taking taxis a little bit more in the south uh, to be worth the amount of time and energy that we spent uh, doing it the other way. But other transportation tips that I have for you are about tuk-tuks and taxis. First of all, tuk-tuks. Um, the government rate is about 18 rupees per kilometer with a flag rate of maybe, uh, you know, 50 to 100 depending on the actual region and how far you're going. But everyone is basically driving a tuk-tuk to try and make ends meet and that means that some folks are more honest than other folks. So if you pre-look up the distance of your trip and see that it's three kilometers, then you know you probably should be paying really over you know, 70, 80, maybe 100 rupees if you're being generous. Locals would probably pay less than this, uh, maybe only even 30 to, to 75, depending on the hill situation, depending on the true distance um, when they weave around, and just generally how that tuk-tuk driver is feeling. So some tips to make sure you don't get run around on the tuk-tuk and in a taxi is to first load up your GPS with your data from that Indian cell phone you have, and uh, make sure you follow along to keep them honest. It's okay for you to direct how your ride goes. It's okay for you to give uh, feedback on where they go and for you to try to limit the amount that they're charging you. I have found almost none of these folks are going to use the meter. In Pune, everyone used the meter. A few times here and there, everyone used the meter. But your best bet is to always ask what price it is before you get in, because they'll just say, get in. Yeah, no problem, I'll take you there, get in. Don't get in. <laughs> ask them how much Kipna Rupi or whatever the local dialect is, ask them how much will it be and hold them to that. Um, and only hold them to that if that price is good. We have seen places where there's a big board up behind the tuk-tuk stand and it says prices to get to local destinations. And it'll list prices, you know, 100 to this place, 200 to that place. And the guy's sitting right there like we can't see the board and he's like 300 for the $100 ride. So if you see that, you can point to it and say, well, it's 100 there on the board. The other option you have is to uh, haggle them down no matter what. Just always try to reduce the price a little bit um, based on your comfort level. And uh, do not be afraid to walk away to test it. So for instance, uh, someone pitched me one time 300. I said, oh, yikes, uh, 100, 100 for me. This is only two kilometers away, and I think that's a fair price. That's even more than you'd get. They said, no, 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 not a good price. So if you're worried about coming off cheap or coming off rude, simply say, you're right, sir, I apologize. I do not want to give you an unfair price. I'm going to go ask around and see what the price is. 
If he immediately stops you and comes back with something, you're on the right track for your price. So you don't have to yell and bicker and swear and get worked up and, and be like a mean seeming, you know, Westerner who, who doesn't have appreciation for their hard work. You can simply say, of course, I don't want to give you an unfair price. I'm sorry, sir. I'm going to take a minute and walk around. And if they really want the business, they'll start lowering the price and telling you what the, what closer to the real price is. Also, don't expect, you know, to split hairs over 10 rupees or 20 rupees. Um, if you're a Westerner, you know that this amount of money overall isn't a huge deal and maybe just is something you have to be budgeting for. Um, don't focus too much on what locals get. Just do the best you can for what Westerners get, in my humble opinion. Also, for tuk-tuks and taxis, many bus stations, airports, and so on have stands where you pay one to three rupees via a coin and they just give you a prepaid ticket. They tell you, oh, well, where are you going? They punch it into their computer and then it says, 300 rupees, 312 rupees. Now this worked recently very, very well as we started coming into the south where we got quoted at the bus station from just people we were asking 500, 700, 650, um, and the prepaid price was only 350, and, and, and many of these uh, gentlemen and sometimes women driving tuk-tuks were happy just to take that prepaid ticket and take us to where we wanted to go. So if there is a prepaid booth, you're generally going to get the best price doing it that way because it kind of combines a small premium for foreigners but that premium is based on the lowest sort of local usual price and it's based on the government rate which is you know 18 rupees per kilometer plus a flag rate so this may actually help you secure tuk-tuks and taxis without the haggling if that's not something you're comfortable with other transportation stuff if you're taking a train, arrive early, but still expect a delay. Get the mostly helpful app called Confirm Ticket. That's Confirm TKT. That'll let you enter in the train numbers and see where your train is at, where you are at. And also watch closely because they do not announce the stations. It's up to you to know when to get off. And many of the trains run from one entire corner of India all the way down to the other end of India and you just have to know where to get off in between. We recommend packing a scarf to cover the pillow on the train. You know, honestly, we've been taking three, three AC, which is third class air condition. That's when there's three tiers of sleeper platforms in the train and, uh, and, and people just sleep above each other in like triple deck bunk, bunk beds. This is actually totally fine. It's fairly comfortable, but I have seen a lot of these sheets being just refolded back up, put into a new paper bag, and reused. So I am not that great with pretending I'm not sensitive to the idea of germs. So the way around this is bring your own lightweight sheet, put it on first, and then put that stuff on top of it. At least create a barrier for yourself. Uh, a scarf or a small pillowcase for going over the pillows may also make you feel comfortable as well. And this is very lightweight to pack. You can also use a spare t-shirt or another garment to put over the pillow. Maybe something that uh, you wore once and you're going to launder or a sleep shirt or anything like this. Just think about bringing another cloth membrane to cover up those train sheets. Or, like a lot of people, just ignore it. <laughs> oh, gosh. You're probably going to want to pack your own toilet paper. Just to have it handy. For various reasons. One. The toilet paper here is almost non-existent. They use bum guns or like those little spray bidets. That's cool, but sometimes, you know, you might need toilet paper. Keep in mind that a lot of places you don't flush the toilet paper, you might put it in a waste basket that's provided right there for you. And also keep in mind that a lot of the toilet paper here disintegrates into nothing <laughs> as soon as you start using it. So you might need to, uh, to test out a couple types and see what you like. Continuing on transportation, Scooters. In places where you don't need an international license to rent a scooter, we found in Goa um, and in uh, Gokarna and some of the beach places, um, if you just have your own license from home, they're happy to rent you a scooter. This was amazing for us. Uh, in Goa and Gokarna and uh, Udupi, this was so key because you're going to take tuk-tuk trips from one side of Goa to the other and they're going to try and fleece you. Honestly, taxis and tuk-tuks were insultingly high-priced. 
a thousand dollars for a tuk tuk for like five or ten kilometers just brutal where other places maybe we're talking about 500 you know double triple the price however one day of scooter rental even in the most expensive place doesn't exceed a thousand rupees in fact most places it's about 300 to 500 a day for a full 24 hour period and gas gas for a scooter is so cheap um, we filled up one tank for about eight dollars Canadian and we used that for almost four days and that was traveling all the way north and all the way south in one area seeing all the beaches going at whatever time we wanted whenever we wanted so if you're gonna be in any of the beach areas strongly recommend you rent a scooter try it out a little bit before um, if you want to try it at home maybe borrow a friends or uh, if you already know how to ride a scooter that would be very helpful it's pretty easy it's pretty safe just um, Another tip about renting scooters is to start with someone who has their own big lot somewhere. If you rent it right off the main drag, you're going to feel a little self-conscious as you try and learn the controls. Controls are very easy, but you kind of need some room for error if it's your first time ever using one. Promise though it's easy. You can go off to the left and stay in the slowest part of the lane with the bicyclists. You can let everyone pass you. Scooters actually get a fair amount of leeway here, and if it's in not one of the big chaotic cities, you're gonna have an easy time, I promise. Rent a scooter. Planes. We're actually not taking very many planes in country because we don't have the budget for that. We're just uh, sort of in the backpacker budget range with a tiny bit more budget on our accommodation. We did take a plane already to Goa via Indigo and it was sort of like if WestJet or uh, Air Canada cared only a teeny bit more for their customers than they do in Canada. Wasn't terrible, wasn't great. Walking, that's a form of transportation, right? Keep in mind that they drive on the left here. So when you walk um, as a Westerner from a place where we drive on the right side of the road, it was very normal feeling for me to keep wanting to inch to the right side of the sidewalk when really I should be moving to the left. So remember that how the road rules are, that's generally how the walking and sidewalk rules are. That said, a lot of the sidewalks are non-existent, so you end up walking on the very edge of the road. If there's a white line, even if there's only a teeny bit of space, you've got to do your best to stay on the inside of that white line off the road. And please know that cars generally here are just conditioned, drivers are just generally conditioned here to come right close to you, pull right in front of you if you're walking. They own the road. So it's going to seem like people are being pretty rude at times when they just drive directly in front of you and stop for seemingly no reason. Please get used to it. Please just understand that that is seemingly how they do it here in most places. Be prepared to divert, go around, let them in, and just know that they may pull in front of you, they may get in your way, but ultimately their duty is to not run you over. So the margins are kept very close and um, that's just the way it is. So let's talk about accommodation, food, and sickness. First, check your room. The very first place we got to in Delhi had a vibe to it. It was older and had character and, and seemed okay. It was in a part of town that, you know, being new to India, being thrust right into India, was giving us kind of an overwhelming feeling. But just, there was lots of old wood, there was the smell of mothballs, and with my experience previously working in community inclusion housing and having dealt with bed bugs and knowing what to look for, this place immediately gave me the creeps. And so when we pulled back the bed and looked, we saw it was filled with ticks and bed bugs. You don't have to stay in a place like this, it's grounds for a refund and in this case it was an Airbnb place. We were immediately refunded. We just went to another place. Just know that once in a while if you're staying, especially if you're staying on a budget, you may have to reroute. Now, this has happened once in about 25 places we've stayed. Everything else has been pretty good. Um, you do have to have some tolerance for how clean or not clean a place may be by your own sort of Western standards, but otherwise, please, check for bed bugs. You do not want to pick them up in your suitcase. You do not want to deal with an allergic reaction to them. And you most certainly do not want to get tick bites here. So things to look for that will trigger you to really understand that this place may have bed bugs. 
If you see a mattress that is uncovered, maybe it just has a sheet, that can be okay. But check along the folds of the mattress. If there's detritus in there, if there's speckles of blood, or if there's something that looks like little bits of dirt, this is detritus. This is fecal matter from bed bugs. Opt out. If you see many layers of blankets in between a box spring, in between a mattress, they've got all sorts of layers on it. Peel back each layer. They may be trying to do um, what keeps them less visible, which is to provide like a labyrinth of blankets for them to move through. Doesn't matter. They rely on the smell of your body and the carbon dioxide you produce and they will find you while you sleep. So make sure if you see layers upon layers of blankets, you peel back all the layers, you look. The other thing is, is that bed bugs love, love old wood, slats, creases and little, and little crevices in wood cardboard, etc. Carpet. If you see any of these around the bedside area, check those carefully as well. Bed bugs themselves are in usually sort of little clusters or nests, somewhere up and out of the way or down and out of the way, but they can hide anywhere near the bed. They do tend to like older, less maintained rooms, but even a five-star place can have bed bugs. It doesn't necessarily mean that any sort of half dirty place or a place that's not up to your personal standards as a Westerner has bed bugs but it can happen more often when things are less cared for. Bed bugs can look like little round, sort of lentil sized, pill looking bugs. They can be brown or red or even like a purplish color. The bottom line is, is once you see them, you'll know. If there's any bugs in the bed at all, assume they're bed bugs and get the f out of there. I'm not trying to scare you, but it's a way bigger problem to try to deal with this and then forever remove the paranoia you have when you're sleeping. So please, check for bed bugs, check for ticks, and get out of there if they have them. There is no way to try to like repel them or just sleep safely in a room with bed bugs. For many of our accommodations, we've liked packing our own flat sheet. This has been pretty handy. Lots of places just have a bare mattress and then a sheet that isn't fitted on top, so you may want to put another sheet down to give yourself more protection. Um, you may want to uh, consider that in a lot of places, if you're going like a lot of Westerners do, say between October and April to India, well, for them, this is the cold season, but for us, it's going to be like summer. So some places have cold season blankets on the bed already, which for us is very hot. So I've enjoyed having my own sheet so that I could just use a sheet with a fan if I needed to, um, but you do whatever is comfortable for you. But consider having that sheet. It comes in handy on the train, comes in handy in your accommodations, and so on. I've also found it helpful to bring my own travel towel. Sometimes towels are great. Most of the time the towels are great, but you may want another one to take to the beach. You may want one to have just in your own sort of uh, backpack to do whatever you might need to do with that. Um, consider one of those thinner travel towels that feels a bit like a chamois that you roll up. They pack light and guaranteed you're going to be happy you have that. Oh, and by the way, about the sheet, thanks mom! My mom gave me a sheet before I left as part of a gift and uh, we're using it a lot. So thanks for that sheet, mom. Showers. Real talk about showers. If you have hot water, if, it's generally a little tricky to figure out how to use it. They have these things called gazers geysers and it's like a small hot water tank you turn it on you wait for it to heat up you mix a little bit of the coal and the hot water together and it starts coming out let me tell you ahead of time that when those work the hot water does not last long also there's a bucket and a smaller container in almost every bathroom here the bucket is for catching the extra hot water and believe me at first i was like i don't need that what am i gonna what am i gonna just like catch all the hot water in a bucket and pour it over myself yes that's exactly what you're going to do because you may not have enough hot water. The bucket is generally about as big as the geyser. So you'll pull the, uh, the plunger or push the plunger for the shower. The shower will come, but they'll still be from the tap leaking out a bunch of the hot water. Put the bucket under there, catch the hot water. You're going to thank me. Let it fully heat up. And in a place where the hot water is tenuous or runs out quickly, fill the bucket of hot water up first. Let it keep heating. Start your shower with the warm water that's left and then finish off with that bucket of hot water. You're going to need it, I promise you. Laundry. You can do your own laundry, or you can get it done. If you get it done, please know that they're gonna charge you by piece. We've had our laundry sent out or dropped off or whatever a number of times already, and only once have I ever been charged by weight. 
which is a great value. By piece, it's anywhere from 30 to 60 rupees per piece for large pieces, and that would be like pants, shirts, etc. Underwear and socks per piece are charged between 15 and 30 rupees. So two socks is 30 rupees to 60 rupees, depending on how they charge it. Now generally this means that your average load of laundry almost everywhere has been about 12 to 16 dollars Canadian. A decent sized load, comes folded, beautifully done, all of that. But if you want value, rent Airbnbs that have a laundry room, rent a homestay that has a laundry room, um, or check for places that have a laundry rack outside so you can wash your own stuff maybe in that bucket they provide you in the bathroom. Hmm? Everywhere has such intense feelings about laundry, evocative words about the rigorous process by which they complete the cleaning, the, the deep cleansing of your laundry. It comes ironed, it comes folded. So do know that if you do send it out, it's generally done very, very well. <laughs> One place called, t called me before doing the laundry and listed and gave photograph of, photographic evidence of all of the different flaws that my laundry had. One had a small hole in it, it's something I was using as a sleep shirt. It has a small hole in it. They wondered, do I want to keep this? Should they just throw it out? This has a hole. Um, socks documented with, you know, if I have white socks and I had been walking on sand and there was a bit of a brown stain, they'd let you know ahead of time, this may not fully come out, we will do our best. So be prepared for them to unpack your laundry right in front of you and count it if you haven't already given them a count. Be prepared for them to unpack your laundry and look at all of its flaws and read them out to you right there. And if you have any, um, if you have any intimate apparel that maybe has stains or something on it that you don't want um, looked at right in front of you, give it a little pre-wash. <laughs> Time to talk about sanitation and food poisoning. Stuff we've learned, stuff we knew, I'm passing it on to you, okay? First of all, it's very likely that you're going to get traveler sickness when you come to India. You're gonna do your best, you're gonna do the things you know you should do, not eating meat, maybe avoiding the milk products, maybe not eating pre-cut vegetables and fruits that are just off the street, um, being careful about what you choose, making sure that you eat piping hot, burning hot food from a busy, busy restaurant so you know that they are making fresh food constantly. You've done all of that, you're doing a great job, but I can pretty much guarantee you're still going to get sick at some point. Mm. Please know that if you get sick here with diarrhea and that has stomach pains, if you cannot manage it with Pepto-Bismol tablets, say, for even um, more than six hours, maybe two episodes, you're going to need treatment. Treatment's usually very easy. In our case, we prepack antibiotics, so uh, lopiramide or ciprofloxacin. These things are excellent. Now, you might be feeling like you don't want to take antibiotics, but I promise you, in India, if you're sick and you cannot manage your diarrhea after two episodes, you need to get treatment. Now, that's as easy usually as feeling it come on, taking a couple of Pepto-Bismol tablets, waiting a couple hours, and if it starts becoming more intense, if you have stomach pains, get on your course of antibiotics right away. It's going to be three to five days. You can buy them all right here when you get to the pharmacy, right in the city that you land. Every pharmacy will let you just buy it. Research what you need for us. It's low pyramide uh, and ciprofloxacin does it really well. You're going to have relief within two hours. Now, I understand if you're reluctant to take antibiotics, but I promise you, you will be so ill. This is not a type of diarrhea that just goes away. It is a stomach infection that happens because you are not used to the local bacteria and you need to make sure that you take care of that or it's going to ruin your trip. Mild traveler's illness is when the water switches, you eat some spicy food, you get a bout of diarrhea, you treat it, and it starts settling down. You don't have stomach pains, you don't have intensifying diarrhea, and you don't have vomiting. Treat that just like you would at home. Assume that it's going to go away, and if it doesn't, if you have any more than two episodes of diarrhea in six hours or even 12 hours, it's time to start thinking about antibiotics. Because if you start vomiting, you're not going to be able to keep those antibiotics down. You must go to a clinic. You must go to a hospital, which are everywhere and incredibly cheap, and get an IV. Now this happened to Natalia and Booge. Violent vomiting. Very sick. 
She won't want me to describe all the symptoms, but they were profound. <laughs> we had three hours to go before we left for a train. We whisked her to a small private hospital, and 30 Canadian dollars later, and an IV, and two nurses, and a bunch of attention. She was well enough to travel. That made a huge difference. You need to understand that we are not all conditioned to, to uh, endure India's sanitation practices, which are fine for them and maybe not for us. Their, um, their generous distribution of uh, different types of bacteria, which we haven't been exposed to. Please don't be a hero. Please don't get more sick than you need to be. Go right away to a hospital or a clinic. Carry the drugs ahead of time and just know that no, your immune system may not protect you in this case. And now, if you don't get sick and you can do it, I am stoked for you. But please know that once you get sick, you need to start thinking about what you're going to do. Now, the number one way to avoid getting sick is avoid water. What? Don't I need to drink water to live? Yes, you do. But none of it should be from the tap. None of it should be from any water-based substance in any restaurant. That means ice. No exceptions. You will not get used to it after a month. Oh, maybe I can have ice now. No, you can't. Stop it. Stop that. You need to drink bottled water and drinks only. Yeah, maybe you like the ice faluda made with coconut milk. Maybe you like the slushies, you know, with the coconut water, the frozen coconut water and the ice. Even if they say they used RO ice, that may be true. They might have very, very clean water being used for their ice. However, their hands going in and out of that ice machine all day, everyone working there handling the ice. People here handle things barehanded a lot. It doesn't make them sick, so why would they need to care so much? Even when they glove, there's still the, the chance for the flies who feed on the sucrose of the sugar cane to drop by. There's still lots of ways you can get exposed, and the number one way to avoid that is drinking only bottled water and juices. If they say it's filtered water, honestly, I would still just assume you need bottled water. Now, India, I really love you. I am not saying that you're dirty. If you're Indian and watching this, just know that Westerners are incredibly sensitive in our stomachs because of the way we sterilize every last thing ahead of time. We actually don't give our immune systems generally as good a chance to evolve like your gut biomes have. So this is not to say that everyone's hands here are dirty and that everything is bad, but there are notable sanitation differences here and it can definitely make Westerners sick. And definitely you will, if you're here for any amount of time, you will encounter this. Now about health, please don't come to India without health insurance. Tuk-tuk accidents, cars, injuries, uneven sidewalks, traveler's sickness, lots of different stuff could happen to you here. Now, it doesn't mean that it's always innately incredibly dangerous, but there are far less safety precautions here than there are at home. I'm thinking about firecrackers blown off by little kids. I'm thinking about um, seat belts being discouraged from use in cars. I'm thinking about when you rent a scooter, how only the driver has to have a helmet. And I was discouraged from getting my partner, Natalia, a helmet to protect her head from cracking open on the concrete if the, if the, un, if the unthinkable happened and we fell off. They said, no, oh, that's an extra 50 rupees a day. Do you really want that? <laughs> an extra 80 cents a day to protect her head? Yes, I do want that. Now, regardless of this, accidents do happen here, so make sure you have good comprehensive health insurance as part of your budget when you come here. Do not chance this. Don't take that chance. I promise you, you'll be sorry if you do. Here's some miscellaneous observations I've noticed. These ones are all sort of in the realm of positive, okay? People here are so friendly. They're so talkative. They're so open. They believe the guest is God. They're so warm and generous and and they ask all the nice questions right away. They want to know you. Um, the children are incredibly polite. They want to hug you. They want to put all their, their clammy little hands all over your face. <laughs> uh, people want you to hold their babies. They want to take selfies with you. They're incredibly generous, kind people everywhere you go. India 
is so moving. They're so knowledgeable about their own history. They're so very kind and they're all uniformly incredibly proud of where they're from, how much they love India and how great the food is, how rich their history is. All of them uniformly know so much of their own history, more than colonialist descended uh, countries like Canada or the United States, etc., all of Europe, whatever, um, way more then we get involved with our own history. So respect that about them uh, and know that a lot of this history includes religion. Um, they're very religious in a very, very sweet and uh, pious way. That is so amazing about people from India. Um, all of their knowledge and all of their deep family connections, everything is really inspiring that way. They're incredibly eager to extend immediate friendship and hospitality. Now, in some places where these things can also be disguised as tourist traps, just watch out for that. But honestly, for the most part, everyone here has been so ardent and so um, genuine in wanting to make friends and communicate with you as far as they can. So I made visiting cards in Kulu because of all the people coming up to me asking, where are you from? What, is your, what are your socials? Do you have a WhatsApp number, etc.? I made visiting cards with all that information on it. Keep in mind, if you hand out a visiting card with that information on it, they're going to use it. <laughs> so I put my phone number on there, I put my socials, I put everything on there. I got video calls, I got Instagram video calls, I got Facebook requests, I got every sort of thing I could want. I got follows on the YouTube channel. Everything that you give them, they're going to use it. So if you don't feel comfortable with that level of engagement, don't put it on your visiting card. But on that side of things, I do recommend printing business cards or, or traveling cards so that you can just hand them your socials and keep in touch with all the nice people you meet. There's also the common head wobble. You might have seen Indian people do this. If you're talking and you're explaining a need and you start seeing this, this means yes, they get it. The head wobble can look to us like, eh, I'm not sure, but in India it means hell yes. Get ready to do that head wobble. And it starts from your chin. Chin down, wobble that head. That is how you do it. <laughs> that is your free tutorial on the head wobble. Okay, real talk. Negatives. Some of these things are just cultural differences, okay? Some of these things, I'm not saying they're right or wrong, and other things are just things you need to be careful of. In Canada, we have 40 million people across a vast expanse of territory, most of which is uninhabited. So, I think probably about one in a hundred, two in a hundred, up to five in a hundred people, maybe are dicks. You know, maybe they're jerks. I feel like this is probably pretty universal. India has 1.5 billion people in a vast expanse of land, and it's very densely populated. So you may feel like you run into jerks more often than you do from your home country, which is not as, as highly populated. Do you know what I mean? Real talk, they ask invasive questions. Why don't you have kids? Where are your babies? How old are you? What is your schooling? Um, you know, maybe comments about weight, things that are very obvious, you know. Um, I know that I have face tattoos and earrings. Most folks here will want to tell me about that, that they noticed it. They'll want to point. They'll want to touch. Um, I found this in Vietnam as well. People sitting right down and cuddling with you from meeting you, wanting to hold your hand. You shake someone's hand here in India and in Vietnam, they hold it a long time. They grasp it with both hands. They might want to touch your head and touch your face. Get used to it. <laughs> it's, hard to, uh, it's hard to change that. If you retreat into yourself every time this happens, you're not going to be able to have a great time here. So just do your best to get used to it and know that in that case, for the most part, they don't mean anything bad about it. Now that said, if they're asking you where you're staying, how long you're going to be there, if you're alone, etc., don't give them that information. But if it's just stuff about your family, stuff about your marital life, stuff about stuff that's obvious that people can see about you, just know that you're going to have to confirm it over and over. Oh yeah, yeah, I do. I like, I like tattoos. Oh yeah, these are earrings. Yeah, it does go right through. Just know that you're going to have to say that a lot and uh, you're also going to be asked for selfies and you're also going to be asked every damn where, what country you're from, do you have babies, where is your wife, where is your husband, where, 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 all of that. Just be prepared to answer it. They're being friendly. This is the way they break the ice. Sales pitches and touts. So, I think 
the fact that I have obvious displays of status to them, like tattoos, they know that this is expensive. They don't know that I traded for a lot of my tattoos and didn't pay money for that. They don't know that the cost of living in Canada and the United States is outrageous and that we escaped to India to have any semblance of a vacation feeling so that we can um, not pay European prices. A lot of folks maybe just don't know that. Um, so it is assumed that you're rich. If you're white or you appear to be Western in any way, it's assumed that you're rich. And compared to them, you probably are um, in some cases. Sales pitches and touts are everywhere especially in the more touristic places. You are going to be asked to buy every friggin thing that's available. Some people may be very persistent. You're gonna learn how to have to just say no and keep walking. Don't turn back when they call you again. Don't engage to try and talk them out of touting you. Just say no, no, stay firm, be unyielding in that way and move on. Same thing if people are begging for alms or whatever. You need to know how to give a firm no and mean it. If you're not the person who finds it easy to say no and you won't be able to learn or even pretend or do some acting, you're going to have a tough time here. So I've made lots of new friends here, but again in the real talk category, a lot of those friends have later asked me for money. Now, if you know someone close enough and you find that they're in need and you have the money to give, you may want to decide to do that. We, we, we have done that here on a couple occasions because we knew the person wasn't doing it for sort of nefarious reasons or just trying to use us. But there are people, you give them your card, you say hello, you take a selfie, you move on and you get a message in 20 minutes, you know, demanding some amount of money for a health problem or whatever. Please don't paint every Indian person with the same brush thinking that they're all going to be asking you for money. But also know that if you're a Westerner, it's likely. There has been something that's been happening here to us because I think we maybe seem cool to some people or the tattoos or like us being a couple who are kind of like quirky or whatever. We get kind of leveraged by small groups of young men who seem friendly at first but actually just want us to buy them booze. So you're going to meet a lot of 17, 18 year old guys who are super cool kids, super cool cats, they're hanging around in a group of four or five guys and uh, they want to just hang out with you. No big deal, they just want to hang out. So they track you down on Insta and you say, oh well sure, you know, like I'll meet you over at the beach. Um, they may want to go to a bar, whatever it is, even if they're drinking age, they may want to go to a bar and hang out. That's up to you if you want to just hang out and have a beer. But if you're not explicit in saying that you're not paying for it, they may consider it an invite and whoever does the inviting um, is the one who does the paying. So don't get roped into being leveraged by young men to try to get you to boot for them or buy you booze. There are plenty of places that'll serve them, it seems, and they'll turn you the bill and they may run off. Now this almost happened to us once, but I saw what was happening. I got ahead of it. I cut it off when I realized that they were definitely underage, that they had said a different lie about their age. And I went over to the barkeep and I said, here's the, the, the bill, we've been here five minutes. Natalia, Natalia had a beer. They ordered a bunch of other stuff that was kind of like dicey. We paid ours and we just left. Don't be afraid to cut it off when you know what's going on. Um, a lot of times people do just want to make honest, uh, genuine friendships. That's okay. I'm not against making friends with someone younger or older. You'll get all different ages and all different people who want to be your friend and that's really cool. That's a really cool part of India. Um, just be careful about if you're feeling being leveraged. Something that happens a lot here is people will want to sample you goods. That's nice, nice to try some things, but sometimes it gets a little intense. Again, I'm thinking more of younger men. I'll give you an example. We were in Kulu for Deshera, and I love kacha mango ladu, which is like these little balls of kacha mango, which means, um, which means unripe mango. So it's green mango that's been sweetened, dried and sweetened and kind of ground up into these little circular candy balls. I love these. I love these. So I wanted to buy some. And I said to the guy, I'll, I'll just buy it. I'll buy the, I'll buy the big bag of the, of the kacha mango. He gives me a sample of something else. I say, oh, yeah, okay. I eat it. I go, okay, well, thanks. I'm just, I'm just going to stick with what I ordered. Thank you. He's not giving it to me. Gives me some salted mango with hang powder on it. I already know I don't like this. Um, it's fine. Some people like it, I do not. I'm already telling him what I want to buy. He's like, oh, try this now, try these crackers. And I'm like, bro, 
Just sell me the thing I want. You've made a sale. Please take my money. I want to go. Hands us samples again. Tamarind he's handing us. Chips. Forcing us samples and trying to like get and starting to pack up the bags. So as a lesson, I wanted that kacha mango so bad, I'll tell you what. I really wanted it. But I just turned around and walked off. Lesson has to be learned in people doing sales. If the customer gives you a sale, sell it to them. Um, so I ended up walking off because it felt just like harassment at that point. He's not selling me what I wanted to buy. Even the buddy he was with who was running like another half of the stall beside him couldn't believe him. So I know I was in the right there. And uh, keep in mind, you don't have to take samples. You can just state what you want. If they don't give it to you, you're going to have to walk away. There's lots of times in India where you just have to walk away. <sighs> There's lots of litter here. There's lots of piles of trash on the side of the road. There's a lot of sick, stray animals, including cows, dogs, cats. There's a fair amount of poverty in places. There's differences in practice with sanitation, clearly. And you just gotta do your best not to judge it. Now the litter happens because there aren't municipal programs to dispose of waste properly, and it ends up in sort of burning piles. Litter on the beaches is not uncommon. It's best to research your beaches ahead of time. For instance, we went to Mandavi Beach in Buj, Gujarat. It was, it was pretty dirty. Um, now I hate saying a country is dirty. I think that sounds so dumb and white. Oh, it was dirty there. Oh, I think it's very dirty. You know, for a lot of it, buck up. Get over it. You're in a developing country. You came here. You have privilege. Get over it. But, gosh, in a lot of places, there is a lot of litter. So, if you need help researching with that or you want to know the good places, I do mention litter in the videos, if there is litter. I uh, discreetly show it if you watch the videos. And a lot of it is that you're just going to have to tolerate that things here are not like they are at home, um, especially if you're a Westerner. Now, tons of places are incredibly clean. Pune was very clean. Um, large parts of Goa were very clean. Um, Gokarna, Udupi, etc. Lots of those places, very clean. But Jaipur, a lot of Rajasthan, um, Delhi, a lot of the big cities, they're going to feel to you like they're not clean. And that's just how it is. Um, in the restaurants, a lot of times tables won't be fully wiped. You can ask them to wipe it. Um, you're going to maybe get the odd bit of dirty cutlery and questionable plates. Maybe bring your own Lysol wipes or whatever you need to tidy it up yourself to your standard. But just know you are going to encounter situations around sanitation and cleanliness that feel like a challenge for a Westerner. I want you to try and make sure you're not judging as this happens because, again, they don't need it to our level because they're fine. They live perfectly fine here. And their systems, in a lot of cases, do work really well. And to boot, a lot of places are incredibly clean. It's a, it's a spectrum of practices among a whole bunch of different people. Um, so some people are still incredibly fastidiously clean with their restaurants or their house. And other people, they sweep up, they wipe up as they need to, but that's it. Again, there is very little to no toilet paper. Get over it. Buy your own. If you want it, and you need tissue and toilet paper, you're gonna have to carry it. Food sanitation. I'm just touching on this a bit more. Um, lots of stuff is done barehanded. There's no way to escape this, except to not drink the water, to be careful about eating anything with water in it. For instance, Golgape or Pani Puri. Learn who makes those water bombs with the water that is bottled and not the tap water. You know what I mean? Think about it. If it's served to you cold and it's liquid, think twice. Think twice about drinking water from any shared vessel. If they're taking bottled water and pulling, pouring it into a clay pot with a tap that you're supposed to use communally, think twice. Also, food handling generally. If it's cut already for you and you didn't see it get peeled, you didn't peel it yourself, Think twice. A lot of people here chew tobacco. Mostly men, but women too. And when you chew tobacco, 
What is the byproduct? Brown spit. I don't know how to put this delicately, so I'm just going to say it plainly. There's a fair amount of brown spit everywhere. Not like everywhere, everywhere, but sometimes in places where you would expect it not to be. For instance, in Delhi and Connaught Place, which is a major shopping center where people with privilege in Delhi and tourists go. And a lot of it's lined, it's got these two inner circles, and a lot of that is lined with white marble and white plaster. Well, in every corner of that white marble and white plaster are huge puddles up the walls and down on the ground of brown chewing tobacco spit and stains. Again, even when we were going through Amr Palace in some of the places, some of these beautiful historic monuments just covered in places with spit. Do your best to get over it or do your best to avoid it. Also, public urination. Yep. It happens a lot. They're usually somewhat discreet about it, but often they're not. Look away. Use your nose to help you determine which spots to avoid. Now, just a general one. These fucking panels of switches on the walls. There's like these panels of switches. Maybe you can see one. There's some here. Okay? It's like 20 different switches. And it's so... There's no... There's no head or tails to it. There's no rhyme or reason to how you just click them off and on. You're just clicking and clicking and clicking, click, 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 click. Which one's for the fan? Honestly, do your best. <laughs> that has been a frustration here. Sometimes they don't work. Sometimes you have to pre-turn on a switch for each outlet. Sometimes the switch is outside on your way into a building. Sometimes it's, you know, outside of the bathroom, you turn it on, but inside you have to turn on the switch for the, the hot water. It's just Bananas! Make sure you buy your own power bar here and you get a good one with a surge protector and everything to convert your electronics. We use a different plug in Canada and the United States than they do in India. So have it have a surge protector, have it have a nice long insulated cord and don't skimp out on this or you're going to blow up your electronics, okay? That's important. Daytime heat. Yeah, you're not getting away from the heat. So if you want to, the way to do it is to do things at night. Sleep during the day, do stuff that's inside, but for the love of God, don't expect everyone to cater to you. They, are, they do well in the heat. We do not. Um, and yes, that's while you're here in winter. We've been in places that are 35 degrees already with burning, hot, humidity, fraught heat. Move to doing stuff at nighttime if you want. So I think that's about it. Tell me in the comments, did I miss anything about the real talk? Did I miss anything about the positive talk? What tips and tricks do you have for travel in India? And um, wish me well on the next half on my trip. Where should I go as I head up the northeast coast and then toward uh, Barnas and, uh, and even Punjab? Where should I go? Tell me in the comments where you want to see me. And uh, thanks very much for watching. For Vegan Everywhere, I'm David.